You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Soleri. As a life coach, Nancy can teach you how to stay strong under pressure and work through challenges you face. Being legally blind, Nancy inspires others to be resilient in overcoming obstacles and live full out. You can ask Nancy for advice in your life on relationships, finance, business, health, and more. Just call in at 800-333-0001. Once again, that's 800-333-0001. Now, here's Nancy. Hello, and welcome to Living Full Out Show. My name is Nancy Soleri, and today we're going to be talking about instability, when our life is just a little unsettled and things appear or seem out of control. How do we bring stability back into our life? We're going to be focusing on that. We're going to have our inspirational guest coming up in our next segment, Casey Berna, and she's going to talk about her journey with endometriosis. And honestly, anybody who knows somebody with that condition, it is not a fun one. And it's very painful, but yet there are so many great resources now for somebody dealing with that condition. So stay tuned for that. Also, if you'd like to call into the show, the number is 800-333-0001. Again, 800-333-0001. And if you want to hear today's show again, go to livingfullout.com. All of our shows will be waiting there for you to hear again and again. And even I go back. I listened to a couple shows the other day on the plane and It was just really nice to hear some interviews back again, and I got the lessons all over. Um, And then also, if you have questions on today's show, we always want to make sure that you feel supported. So email us at connect at livingfullout.com, and we'll make sure to get in touch with you and get you the coaching or resources that you need so that you can thrive and live a life full out. And if you have an inspirational story, one that you'd like to share with our community, again, we would enjoy hearing that story and and perhaps having you on as a guest for the show. So again, this topic today is instability. And so we're going to go to the phone lines now and talk to one of our callers and see what's going on. Hi, welcome to the Living Full Out Show. Hi, thank you for calling in. How can we help you? Hi, um, so I have a question. I'm a college student. And I live in an apartment right off campus with three other um, roommates. I do not get along with two of them at all. I want to be comfortable to live back in my apartment. What should I do? And how can I become comfortable in my apartment again? So are there are there four of you then? There's four of you in the apartment? Yes, there is. Okay. And so two of them you don't get along with, one you do? Yeah. Okay. And is did you sign a lease where you're kind of locked in? And if so, for how long? Um, it's for a year, and I have about two months left. You have two months left. Okay, so the good news is you only have two months left, right? Yeah. And next year, yeah. I bet you're not going to room with those two girls or people, no, right? Not. Right. No. So, so that's something to look forward to. However, how do you get through those two months? You have a couple options. Number one, you don't want to sit back and let people walk over you, but at the same time, you want to minimize confrontation if you can. So prioritize when you're going to engage with them, when you're going to push back, okay? If you push back every time, you're going to exhaust yourself. And quite frankly, some people that like conflict, they kind of get off on it. Like they they like to stir the pot. They like to poke at you, right? Yeah. And so if one of them or both of them are those people and they like to trigger you, don't let them have that power, okay? Okay. You got to outsmart them. Okay, which means okay. that you're not, it's not like you're a coward if you stay in your room. It's not like you're a coward if you don't stay at home and you're other places, but just try to stay away from them or try not to hear them. Um, so, for example, I, I realize sometimes a TV is a central location. Well, if you get there first and you have the remote, then you have the power, right? Okay. So just yeah. manage getting there first, right? If you know that they have certain schedules and they might be in the kitchen or in the bathroom, try to anticipate that and be in the the bathroom or in the kitchen when they're not there. Do you see what I'm saying? I really believe if you try to organize yourself a little bit so you're not around them, the two months will go by quickly. Now, the thing is, when you do have a confrontation with them, you can't reason, you cannot reason with someone who doesn't hear you. Okay, all you can do is state your case and ask them if they could repeat back to you what you said. That's called paraphrasing. They may or may Mm -hmm. not do it. And that's really all you can do. You kind of have to give it up, 
right? Yeah. So, but I think if you do those things, then you'll definitely, you know, get through the two months and just next year make better choices on roommates. Okay? Yeah. I realized that after. You know what, though? We've all been there. I have had roommates that have been like, uh, how, how did I get here? We've all been there. So now you've checked that box. You've checked the bad roommate box. Check. Done it. Right? So yeah. now here going forward, it's better roommates ongoing. Okay? Yeah. But thank you okay. so much for calling in. Thank you. You got it. So she's obviously dealing with instability. I know I've been there. I'm sure many of you have as well. A living situation, that's our that's our place of peace. That's our sanctuary. We want to we want to be calm and be happy there. So we'll definitely be sending her some positive wishes. Uh, we have another caller on the line. We're going to go say hello to them. Hi, welcome to the Living Full Out Show. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Um, Absolutely. I've been suffering from acid reflux for many years, and I stopped taking medication because uh, it used to give me headaches. Mm -hmm. However, I just control it through diet and uh, exercise. However, um, I'm trying my best to to manage it, but what what what? How can I better uh, to help reduce uh, the symptoms of acid reflux? Well, can you tell me briefly when does this happen for you? Are you? Is it when you're at oh, work? Oh gosh, I've been suffering for it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything that gives you peace? Mm, I could probably start off with more rest. Okay, let's incorporate that. More rest. How much rest do you get right now? Oh, on average, four hours of sleep a night. Can you up that? Oh, that's difficult for doing my uh, busy uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And actually, my not, not only my lifestyle, but just my work schedule. Well, then what I want you to consider is becoming a napper. Okay, and you oh, can actually you, know you can actually take classes on napping, but if you can just rest your eyes for twenty minutes, you don't want to go too deep into a sleep. And even if you don't fall asleep, just a time for you to have it quiet, peaceful, or listen to music. It's just about centering yourself. That would be good. And also with acid reflux, it does come upon surprise. You, do, you know, you don't know when it's going to happen. So when it does happen, just try to be good to yourself. You know, don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Don't let the emotions of it overtake you. Almost anticipate that it's going to happen. Maybe it happens once a week, once a month, maybe once a day. But when you don't, when you anticipate it, you don't give it the power over you. Take your power back. Does that make sense? You no, know, it does. I never looked at, I never took it that perspective to it, but I'll, that's definitely going to help me out. I have a friend of mine who has multiple sclerosis, MS, and she actually calls it her. And she has conversations with her. She says sometimes her is going to let her have a good day, and sometimes her is not. And sometimes she'll say, listen, her, I got a big presentation today. Can you just be good to me? And you know, sometimes it's okay to talk out loud and tell our body what we need. Today is a really long day. I just really need you to give me peace. Or you know what? Can you just let me nap for 20 minutes? Is that something you can try? Okay. Yes, I'm going to try that. I'll clear my mind. And then that way, I, yeah, I, I, that, that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Well, you're very welcome. And you know what? We'll be thinking of you and wishing you, wishing you peace, wishing you sleep, you know. And then that's call us definitely. back if you need more support. We're here for you. Definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for calling in. So as we talk about instability today, both of those callers had great questions. Sometimes it's a balance of time. We feel unstable there. Other times it's our health betraying us or feeling like it's out of control. And how do we bring that control into our life? Just like I told the last caller, it really has to start with you. You have to figure out what brings you peace, what relaxes you. What makes you feel healthy? It could be foods, could be people. And you want to start there. Then from there, you want to find people in your life that will keep you accountable or people you can turn to as a sounding board. So when you're having a really full day of anxiety and you know that it's going to cause you stress and it's unstable, who can you call to comfort you? Have that person on standby. Or if you know that you need something to relax you or comfort you, have that on standby. For me, when I'm having a really crazy day, I want to jump in the shower and like switch up the energy. That's what I need to do. So think about for you <coughs> what that is. 
You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Solari. With Nancy's expertise, you'll learn how to embrace your potential and strive for success. If you have a question or need further support, send us an email at connect at livingfullout.com. Now, here's Nancy. And welcome back to the Living Full Out Show. My name is Nancy Solari, and today we're talking about the instability in our life and how do we get our life back on track so we have control, so we feel like we have options and, and hope again. Well, many different things can come up unexpectedly. And sometimes those are health issues. And so our inspirational guest today, Casey Myrna, is going to share with you her journey with endometrius and how she had to kind of overcome the pain, the struggles that came with that, and really developing a positive outlook so that she could thrive in life and live full outs. So I'd like to welcome Casey to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Absolutely. You are just a light in this world. I'm telling you, wait wait till you hear her story. It's just, she's positive, but yet you have endured so much pain. This this journey has not been an easy one. Can you share with us, our our audience, first of all, about what the condition is? Absolutely. Endometriosis is a condition in which uterine lining like tissue tissue that usually lines the uterus um, is present throughout the rest of the body and the presence of this tissue causes a lot of inflammation and a lot of pain and can impact and implicate many organs throughout the body and that just sounds so discomforting in in thinking about it now you you got this uncomfortable feeling early on just after getting your first period and around what age was that absolutely i first got my period at the end of my freshman year of high school i was close i was 14 going on 15 and when i got my period i noticed usually that came along with it was a lot of stomach issues intestinal disruption and upsetness and as well as uh, chronic pelvic pain so really from the start, I noticed that my periods were very uncomfortable. Now, did people in your life, uh, maybe parents or friends, did they kind of brush it off as, well, maybe you just are having really bad cramps? Or did you immediately go to the doctor to find out what's going on? You know what's interesting, and I think my story is similar to a lot of patients, in that my mom had painful periods, my aunts had painful periods. There is definitely a genetic link to endometriosis, if your mom or aunt or sister has it, then you're seven times more likely to experience it. So what happens for me and what happens for a lot of patients that I work with is that painful periods seem to be normalized because that's what your mother experienced, that's what your grandmother experienced. So unfortunately, we really didn't know any better that my pain was not normal. Also, my stomach symptoms were often passed off as anxiety or other issues unrelated to my period. And and so what does one do when you're when you're having this discomfort? Is there medication you can take to to lessen the pain? Is there surgery that you do? What what, what is the next step? Well, for me, I think for a long time I just sort of went along and moved along and endured the pain. I would take Tylenol or Motrin when I had my period. I didn't think to see any doctors or talk to anyone else because I actually thought it was normal. As I got older and my stomach issues became more intense, that's when I sought out a gastroenterologist who, again, did a lot of different tests and really didn't find anything. It wasn't until later when I was having fertility issues that's when I finally was diagnosed with endometriosis. But until then, I really just took Tylenol and Motrin. I had wished that I had known to see an endometriosis specialist and had known that my pain was not normal because there are ways to help women who are experiencing this pain. It, when you look back, do you, do you I don't, you're not probably mad at the doctors, but you wish somebody had done further testing or had analyzed it further to not get that far along in your life? Absolutely. I think when I look back and I think about all the symptoms that I was having, because endometriosis can impact your bladder, your bowels, and I was having a lot of the classic symptoms of endometriosis for a long time. 
And I know patients now still have trouble getting a diagnosis. There is a 7 to 10 year delay in diagnosis, actually. So I wouldn't say it's frustrating to me. I think now as an advocate, it motivates me to try to help other women get diagnosed sooner and help educate the medical community so that patients don't wait so long in terrible pain, wondering what's going on with them. And can they not see it? Can they not see it on the lining? Is it not an obvious catch? That's the problem with endometriosis. So I had colonoscopies. I had upper and lower GI series. I had so many ultrasounds, MRIs. The majority of endometriosis cannot be seen on any CAT scan, MRI, ultrasound. So, And a lot of doctors don't know that, and a lot of patients don't know that. So often a woman will show up to the ER or to their doctor's office in tremendous amounts of pain, and all testing will come back negative. So the doctor will Mm -hmm. say, you know, I think you're fine. Maybe it's stress. Maybe you had a cyst that burst. Um, But come back if you're in pain for, for more testing, and we'll try to figure it out. So endometriosis can be can seem elusive to diagnose because it doesn't show up. But if you really listen to a patient's symptoms, you know, diarrhea, constipation, um, frequent urination, uh, pain with ovulation, painful periods, infertility, all of these symptoms really can lead to a early diagnosis rather quickly. Well, there's probably some people in our audience right now that are checking boxes. I have that, I have that, I have that. And, and yeah. if you are, don't be scared. Because the thing is, is once you know what you have, you can handle it, right? There's a certain, it's scary, the process, but once you have a name to it, once you know the behaviors of it, then you have something you can at least deal with rather than the unknown, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think the uncertainty of not knowing what's going on, why is my stomach hurting, why at times patients feel like their entire body is failing them, and to go to five or six doctors and be told that they're fine and that everything's normal can be incredibly overwhelming, and I think patients start to doubt their sanity. Um, So to understand that endometriosis is is a disease that impacts one in 10 women, and that you're a part of a community of others who understand the disease and that there are doctors out there who can help you. I know I felt very empowered knowing what was going on with me and knowing all those years that all the symptoms were related and that the disease was not in my head. Yeah. It was throughout my pelvis. Well, and that that's that's the discovery, you know, and in, in life we just have to identify what's not working and then take action. Now I want you to stay with us, Casey, because we're gonna take a commercial break, but we'll come right back to your story. And for everybody listening today, if you're dealing with instability in your life, it may be a health challenge, maybe a relationship, maybe job insecurity, whatever that is, even the lessons in her story or what callers call in about today, you wanna apply that to your life so that you can gain the power back and that you can get your life back on a track where you feel purposeful, you feel content and happy. So stay with us. We're going to be further in this conversation about bringing stability back into our life. And I'm Nancy Solari. This is the Living Full Out Show. And we'll be right back after this break. You're listening to Living Full Out with Nancy Solari. As a life coach, Nancy can teach you how to stay strong under pressure and work through challenges you face. Being legally blind, Nancy inspires others to be resilient in overcoming obstacles and live full out. You can ask Nancy for advice in your life on relationships, finance, business, health, and more. Just call in at 800-333-0001. Once again, that's 800-333-0001. Now, here's Nancy. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Nancy Solari, and this is the Living Full Out Show. And we're, today we're talking about instability and how we can re- regain control back in our life in whatever way we can, how to manage the stresses, the anxieties, and they're always going to come. It's just how do we prioritize? How do we find the right supporters, the right doctors, the right resources to put us on a positive path? Now, our inspirational guest today is Casey Burden, who honestly had to deal with endometriosis and her journey with that was painful 
but yet she gained speed, she gained confidence, and she turned herself around to educate people and to really serve other patients. So I'd like to welcome her back to the show. Thank you again so much for having me and allowing me to talk about my journey with endometriosis and infertility. Absolutely. And I want to go right now to what you just referenced, infertility, because for a long time in your story, you kind of hunkered down, you dealt with the pain, you kind of searched for answers, but not not really in depth. But it was when you you tried to have children and this infertility started to come up. Can you share with us what happened around that time? Absolutely. I was young when we first went to a reproductive endocrinologist. I, my husband and I had been trying to conceive for some time with no luck. So we decided that it was time to see a specialist. We went to my regular gynecologist and I expressed my concerns about my painful periods and about the fact that We were having no luck conceiving, and she did eventually give me the referral to see a specialist, and after quite a lot of testing and a lot more uncertainty, all of my testing came back great, and all of my husband's testing was fine as well. My reproductive endocrinologist was the first one to say, you know what, maybe it is endometriosis, and that's when I had a diagnostic laparoscopy surgery to check out, investigate what was happening inside my pelvis. And sure enough, I had endometriosis, which really explained a lifetime of symptoms when I got the diagnosis. Well, and when you get that diagnosis, because, you know, I, I remember the day, the moment I got diagnosed with RP, my blindness, you know, I'm sure you remember the exact day that you got diagnosed with your condition. And in that moment, are you relieved or are you further scared? I think it's probably a mixture of both. Just we were talking about the uncertainty and feeling powerless and not having control over the situation, not knowing what was going on. At least having a name to what I was struggling with felt me, had me feel more empowered. And there was a little bit of fear. What does this mean? What does this mean for my fertility? But the doctor seemed somewhat confident that after the surgery, I would be able to conceive naturally. And so so they did a surgery, and did they remove all of it? Did they get all of it? Unfortunately, no. So the majority of doctors, reproductive endocrinologists, and OBGYNs are not really trained to handle endometriosis surgically. Unfortunately, a lot of doctors perform ablation, And they do a very short surgery where they leave the majority of the endometriosis in. I wasn't aware of this at the time. I was told that I had a little bit of endo and that I would be okay. So I really didn't know any differently at the time I was diagnosed that I would still have more years of struggling with endometriosis and more battles to go before I understood how invasive my disease was. And are there questions you wish you had asked back then that if you could hit the reset button, you'd ask it again, you'd ask today? Absolutely. Following uh, my diagnosis and in my quest, I was still feeling sick after my surgery. I did a lot of searching online. I connected with a lot of advocates, educators, and support groups. So now I know if I could go back in time before I even had my surgery, I would ask the doctor, are you able to identify all endometriosis? Are you able to remove endometriosis off my bowels, off my bladder, off my diaphragm? Are you able to do excision, really getting the disease right from the roots? Are you able to help, you know, my ureters, my kidneys, and do the very meticulous, difficult surgery? And so I had wished, I had wished I had I had known all that then and it asked about all of that. And now I encourage patients when they are looking for a surgeon or a specialist to really vet them and see if they're capable of handling any and all disease that they may encounter while in there. Right. And and, and they could only do what they could do, but how did that um, how did that support your ability to want to have children? 
how did that journey unfold for you? Well, I was very lucky. And while I didn't get pregnant naturally, after a few fertility treatments, I was able to get pregnant with my daughter. And she did come early. She was born at 34 weeks, but ultimately she's very healthy and I am very uh, lucky and very grateful to have her. And, and what treatment did you do to, to, in an effort to get pregnant? What did you do? I, I did um, IUIs. They're called intrauterine insemination. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and did you have to do quite a few of those before it worked or did it work? pretty quickly. I did. I did a couple. I tried Clomid and that failed. And then I did a few IUIs and was able to get pregnant with her. So what's interesting here is that there is hope for, for women listening.